Good morning, everyone. Pastor Venter asked me to come to you today and to talk a little bit about the Adventist Discovery Centre, because I am the Adventist Discovery Centre chaplain. And then he had a look at his calendar, and he saw he was preaching, and he said, well, do you mind preaching? So, um, Pastor, every minister needs to sit in the pew of their family every now and again, so I'm glad you have that opportunity today. But um, before we get into the word for today, I'm just going to spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about the Adventist Discovery Centre. How many of you have taken a course with the Adventist Discovery Centre? You see one or two hands. How many of you remember when we were called the Voice of Prophecy? Now, more hands are going up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I am the chaplain there, and that means it's my job to provide a pastoral care and oversight for our students. We have a number of students who uh, come from outside of our church communities, a number of students who aren't able to attend a church, and my role is to help with any questions or any counseling or any issues like that. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time this morning, because we're going to spend our time today actually looking at something far more important. But um, the reason I was asked to come here is the fact that your minister realised that perhaps some of you have forgotten we exist. I mean, we're only next door. I almost drove into the office by mistake on my way here this morning, but fortunately my little sat-nav told me to keep going. But we actually have a whole variety of courses there. We have about 18 different courses covering Bible and health topics. We have everything from a basic health course to a basic course in the Bible. We, if you want to learn a little bit more, we can help you learn how to cook well, how to cope with stress, and we can even point you down the road to some of those more complicated parts of Scripture and some of our special courses. How many of you um, enjoyed our Sabbath school lesson last year for two quarters when we looked at the, book, the books of Paul, Romans and Galatians? Yeah? Okay, now, no one's going to look or check, but um, how many of you found Paul easy? Yeah, not so many hands went up there. Now, did you know we have a course all on Paul? You see, if you had done that, you would have been able to answer all those questions. So maybe, just uh, think about some of the things that you'd like to do in your evenings. If you want to uh, have a look, I'm going to leave some of our course summaries of your past, and you can leave them lying around. Maybe there's someone, a, a friend, a colleague, a neighbour, who would like to know a bit more about basics of good health, or a bit about finding out a little bit about their Bible. Maybe you'd like to do a little bit more study. Maybe you'd like to sit down with your, with your child and read with them and get them to study. We have a program that we're running throughout every church in Wales called Let's Explore, where the parents and the children are sitting down and are learning about their best friend Jesus together. Maybe that's something for your children or grandchildren. Anyway, I, I don't want to take up too much time this morning. But I'm going to leave some materials behind, and uh, the pastor knows where we are. He can always get a few more. And so if you're interested in looking at some of our lessons, if you may be interested in setting up a school here through your church, because we actually help churches run Bible studies, you know, have a word of your pastor, have a word of me on the door, and we'll help you. Because sometimes we have people who want to study, but we don't know what to do with them. We can help you there. So I'd just like to uh, remind you, we're still around, we're neighbours, let's see if we can work together. There's something special about a self-portrait. If you want to try to understand the artist, if you want to try and get inside their mind, if you'd like to view the world as they view the world, search out their self-portrait. If you want to understand what is important to the artist, where do you go? You look for the self-portrait. Because a self-portrait is an opportunity for the artist to forget all about commercial obligations, popular expectations, and they can deliver a statement of intent. They can paint the world, they can paint themselves as they see them. From Leonardo da Vinci to that famous self-portrait of him as an old man, all the way to Salvador Dali's picture of uh, his face of the, uh, as a clock face falling to pieces. 
Looking at these pictures will give you a glimpse into the window of their lives. A few years ago, I visited um, the Picasso Museum in Paris, and as you wandered through the, uh, through the, the halls, you could see how his worldview had changed. At the beginning, he was painting self-portraits in classical style. He moved on to Impressionist style, then Cubism, Primitivism, Neoclassicism, back to prim uh, Cubism, and then by the time he was old, just these little pencil drawings of a man resting with his mortality. It told me how he saw the world. Now, I've got a, if, you, if you want to try an experiment, please don't do it now, but uh, maybe this afternoon, Try drawing your own self-portrait. Take a piece of paper and ask yourself, how do I see myself? What would I like to express about myself to those around me? How do I make sense of the world and the way I see things? And then see if you can make that little drawing of yourself that tells this to someone else. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm fixating this morning on the idea of self-portraiture. Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's Pastor Jacques' fault. You see, a few weeks ago, he asked me to preach, and he told me that today's topic was God's view of the cross. Now, Pastor, I don't know where you're getting your topics from, but you're not giving yourself an easy time. I uh, spoke to a few colleagues in the office and uh, the only advice they could give me was, I'm glad it's you, not me. Although one of my colleagues said they'd pray for me. So you can judge how effective her prayers are later. But thinking about it, praying about it, reading through the scriptures, I realised the only way that I was going to make sense of this all this morning was through the image of a self-portrait. And not just any old picture, but the most beautiful self-portrait in the world. So bear with me for a little bit. Let's keep the question of God's view in the cross and self-portraits to one side. And let's start, as they say, at the very beginning. The Bible tells us that God is not some distant, removed actor in this cosmic drama. It tells us that he wants to be known. He wants a relationship with his creation. Right at the beginning in Genesis, it tells us that God spent time in the company of Adam and Eve. He walked in the garden. Humanity was designed to live in harmony with God. But we all know the story doesn't finish there, does it? Barely... Three chapters later, in a story that we're actually looking at this morning, our Sabbath school lesson, man's actions rip that relationship apart. Sin enters the earth and humanity is banished out of the garden. And God can no longer meet face to face with his mankind. But even here, we see that God doesn't shrink away into the background. He doesn't abandon us. He still wants a relationship with humanity. He still wants to be known. And so God finds ways to reveal himself. God initially reveals himself for symbols. He immediately sets up a system of sacrifice, which develops over time to include the tabernacle and the sanctuary service, and through these actions, words, and the calendar, God is trying to reveal who he is and how we relate to him. He also called people to speak through. He revealed himself through his prophets. Amos 3 verse 7 says that God does nothing without revealing himself through his prophets. He calls Abraham out in order to share a knowledge of God through him and to both bless everyone and be a blessing. Sorry, to bless him and be a blessing to those around him. He calls Moses to speak on his behalf, to call his people out, and also to talk through him to the fledgling nation. Because God wants to be known. But God also chose to reveal himself through words. He inspired the 
authors of the Holy Scriptures to write down their revelation so it could be shared, it could be read, and the heavenly author could be known. For thousands of years, God revealed himself for his symbols, prophets, and writings. He used them then. He still uses them today. But there's a problem with these types of revelation. They're only a partial revelation of God. Each shows a different part of the picture, a different aspect to God, not the complete picture. And they need to be taken together and balanced against each other. But the bigger problem with this, these kind of revelations is that we humans misunderstand it. The symbols that point to God through the sanctuary service and sacrifice were not and are not always understood. We see this in the very next generation. In Genesis chapter 4, the children, Cain and Abel, don't seem to know what they're doing. They have misunderstood. And even though all these symbols pointed towards the Messiah, when Jesus stood in the temple, everything pointing to him, he wasn't recognised. Prophets aren't always listened to either. Sometimes their messages are unpopular and they can be misunderstood. Sometimes prophets aren't reliable and don't do what they're told. Do you remember Moses striking the rock instead of speaking and dashing the symbolism? Or how about um, Abraham, who keeps seeming to forget that he's married? (laughs) And he tries to sort out things, you know, he tries to help God out and gives him a helping, well, more than a hand, and you see where that leads us today. And even though the writings contain universal and everlasting truths, they're written in a specific context, in a specific, by a specific person, and that means in order to understand them correctly, we might have to do some work. Sometimes that can be hard, and sometimes we can make misunderstandings. We see this in Jesus' time, when the Sadducees and Pharisees were arguing over points of doctrine. And we see it today when we kind of try and wrestle with issues like violence in the Old Testament or the role of women in slavery. Sometimes we just don't understand it all. Now, I better be careful, before I misquote it, before you share this all around the internet, I think these three revelations allow us to gain a knowledge of God. They're good and they're true. And they shouldn't be a stumbling block to anybody's faith, but a God who wants to be known, a God who wants to be known and in a relationship with his creation, won't be happy until he's found a way to reveal himself fully. What God needed was a self-portrait. Turn with me to John chapter 1. You can read a few verses from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. Down a bit towards the end in verse 14. And the word became flesh and lived amongst us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. No one has ever seen God It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Jesus reveals God. John chapter 10, verse 30 is clear. The Father and I are one. And at the end of his ministry, on the eve of his death, Jesus declares to the Father, I have made you known. It's in chapter 17. Jesus, it appears, is God's self-portrait. So what does he reveal about God to us? How does he reveal God to humanity? He reveals God through his teaching. 
Jesus' ministry began with teaching. In synagogues, on the hillside, and the village streets, God is revealed for the teaching of Jesus. He judges religious disputes. He talks in parables to, uh, to those around him. And he takes his disciples aside in order to make the kingdom of God known to them. Jesus revealed God by teaching about the kingdom of God. He taught about a God of love, a God who wants to be made known, a God who wants the relationship with his creation, a God who had not abandoned his world, but who loved it and was seeking it out. He cleared up misunderstandings. He challenged those who thought that they knew all about God and he invited people to find their meaning, their purpose in life, their home in the presence of God. Jesus revealed God through healing. See, in a society without effective health care, where illness puts a burden on those around you, where disease is mistaken for misfortune, or worse, God's judgment, Jesus brings healing. And alongside healing comes wholeness. He brought life to those that mattered least in society, and he restored hope to those who had been left behind. Through his healing actions, he demonstrates the loving heart of God. He revealed God by breaking down some of those false views that humanity had had of God. He showed that God isn't the property of one ethnic group or one geographical area. By crossing over borders, by traveling through surrounding lands, by interacting with the occupying forces, Jesus demonstrates that God's love is not limited by race or nationality. His actions showed that God's love is not just for the wealthy, not just for the Jews, not just for men. His love includes the poor, the Gentiles, the women. Jesus demonstrated God's unlimited love and grace for all humanity. His actions reveal a God of love and mercy, not a God of vengeance and punishment. He starts his ministry, do you remember in the, in the book of Luke, he takes up the, uh, the book of Isaiah, and uh, there in, in Luke chapter 4, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim the release of the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind. Let the oppressed go free. Now, if you were reading along in Isaiah, you would see he actually missed out a line there. The next line is, And the day of the vengeance of our Lord. The prophet may have been looking for a Messiah who was going to save a nation state of Israel and defeat the Gentiles. But Jesus showed a God who wanted to save the world and defeat the forces of sin. Jesus also corrected some of the misunderstandings that had arisen out of those previous attempts at God to reveal himself. Now, I'm going off script a little bit here, which is always dangerous. But there's a scene in the life of Jesus in Mark chapter 9 where Peter, James and John witness Jesus transfigured. And Jesus appears, he's covered in bright light. And alongside him, Moses and Elijah appear. And the disciples are in awe of him. And you know, they look at these two people representing you know, the written word, the law and the prophets. And they say, let us build you three tents. And a cloud comes down covers them all, the two disappear, and a voice comes out and says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. I think this is telling us if we ever have a misunderstanding and we're trying to work out between those ways of revelation, the son comes first. If you may be struggling with some of those passages in the Old Testament where it talks about, you know, violent men being close to the heart of God, this says Jesus' story trumps those. Now that's got me to trouble. That will stop me from being invited back. Let's move on. 
But maybe I just need to pause again and state that, you know, I believe Jesus to be truly divine and truly human. How that works is a bigger topic than today's sermon. Although I doubt that the God who created the first humans of his hands would struggle to find a way of painting his self-portrait to be both fully human and divine. Just in case you think I'm going too far off track here. Because as we look at the life and teachings of Jesus, we are looking at God's self-portrait. Through the life and teachings of Jesus, we are able to look into the soul of the artist. We can look into the heart of God. Jesus is how God would like to be made known. Jesus is how God would like to be seen. Jesus is the canvas through which we understand God's gallery of work. Jesus is God's self-portrait. Unfortunately, a knowledge of God alone is not enough to establish a relationship between God and humanity. Of course, it's important, and that's why God attempted to reveal himself down for the ages and ultimately made himself known in Jesus. But as we looked at in our Sabbath school lesson this morning, the relationship in Genesis doesn't break down because Adam and Eve didn't know enough. It didn't break down because they missed lessons that day. It broke down due to sin, and its influence has changed this world ever since, fundamentally. The forces of, the, of sin and the devil are diametrically opposed to that of God and love. And as Jesus reveals God to humanity and draws people towards him, the scene is set for the decisive moment in the great controversy between good and evil. The forces of sin working for an unholy alliance of the powers of the corrupt empire and state religion turn all its attention to Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man. And it all comes down to one place. One moment in time. The cross. It is on the cross that Jesus is killed by sin. It is on the cross that God is truly revealed. John 13, 5. Jesus says, No greater love uh, no one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. It is on the cross that God demonstrates just how far he will go to be reconciled with humanity. So if Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God, God's self-portrait if you wish, then the cross is the place where we see it the clearest. A God who will leave heaven in order to have a relationship with humanity. A God whose love has no physical or artificial border. A God who is willing to lay down his life for his creation. It is on the cross that God's self-sacrificial love is demonstrated. It's on the cross that sin is defeated. It is on the cross that the last barrier between God and humanity is ripped to shreds. It is on the cross where God is revealed. It is on the cross that Jesus makes a new relationship between God and humanity possible. So, to partially answer the question that your pastor sent me a few weeks ago, what is God's view of the cross? The cross is a self-portrait of a God who will stop at nothing to make himself known and have a relationship with his creation. But art requires a response. If I walk out of a gallery untouched, unaffected by the works hung on the wall, well, 
then the artist has failed. It must inspire me. It must bring me to action. It must inspire me to see the world through different eyes, through the eyes of the artist. If the cross is the most beautiful self-portrait in the world, then it must require a response. Jesus said in John chapter 12, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. The cross is to inspire a response. The cross, when we witness the fullness of God's love, we're drawn towards it. Matthew, Mark and Luke include Jesus' teaching to those around him, to his disciples, that says, and he says that uh, if you wish to follow him, it's slightly different in each version, but the, the important thing is he says, you must deny yourself and carry your cross. Now we often look at the idea of denying self, and that's not unimportant, but for a moment I'd just like to focus on what the idea of taking up the cross might include. What does it mean to carry a cross? Well, if the cross is God's self-portrait, cross-carrying disciples will be carrying an image of God. Now, whenever I visit an art gallery, I always see the art students, I'm sure you've seen them too. They're sitting down in front of a famous painting and they have a sketch pad there and they're trying to mimic the masterpiece. And as they sit there drawing away they're hoping to become a little bit more like the master. They copying the lines and the shade and the technique. In a similar way, disciples are those who have been drawn towards the most beautiful self-portrait in the world, and they find themselves trying to copy the image they see, hoping to become a little bit more like the master, like the artist. Now, I'm not very good at drawing, and I can see too many of my colleagues here from the office who remember a, a staff training day and we had to do some art, so I can't even lie to you if I want to. Um, but I can remember as a child trying to draw something. I can't remember quite what it was, but I can remember I'm, I'm making a mess of my paper. And I'm trying to draw it, and it's not quite right, and my paper is becoming messier and messier. And at some point in my hazy memory, yes, I'm getting old enough to have hazy memories, someone, I think it may have even be my dad, came over and looked at my sheet of paper. He tore off the top sheet, revealing a nice, blank, fresh sheet of paper. And then holding my hand, he helped me sketch out the design. I think this is what happens to us. We are drawn to the God we see represented in the cross. The self-portrait tugs at our heartstrings and we attempt to sketch it, but we get nowhere. We make a mess, it just doesn't work, we can't do it on our own. Then, through the power of the cross, we experience a new start. The father rips off the top sheet of paper, revealing a crisp, clean, new canvas. The Holy Spirit gently holds our hand and helps us to trace out the lines we see in front of us. Slowly over time, and I'm pretty sure rubbing out a few bits along the way and maybe, you know, helping a bit of the colouring in, our picture becomes more and more like the one we're copying. It'll never be the real thing. Not until the day we meet the artist face to face. But it should be a wonderful testament, a witness to the beauty that I saw in that self-portrait. I, uh, I never met Picasso, Picasso. That shouldn't be a surprise to you. There's no way I will ever meet him. But one day I hope to meet the artist who painted the most beautiful self-portrait in the world. And I will tell him that it changed my world. It changed the way I saw things. It made me take up art. It made me encourage others to lose themselves 
as they gaze at that picture of love. Uh, sorry, Jacques, I got lost a bit there in the idea of portraits, and maybe I just need to finish and answer that question that you started off with. What is God's view of the cross? When God views the cross, he sees a self-portrait. The self-portrait of a God who wants to be known, a God who wants to have a relationship with this world, a God who wants the world to know his heart is a heart of love. When he looks at the cross, he sees a God. He sees himself who came to this world to show us who he was, a God who wanted to heal and restore, a God whose love crossed ethnic, geographical, racial, economic, gender, age, any barrier. When he looks at the cross, he sees a God who challenges the power of sin, a God who will stop at nothing to reconcile himself with humanity, a God who destroys sin and death through his sacrificial love. When he looks at the cross, he sees a self-portrait. A self-portrait that's been copied and carried by disciples all throughout history and all over the world. When he looks at the cross, God sees his heart of love. When he looks at the cross, he sees the most beautiful self-portrait in all of the world. Amen.